Yeah. For me, before I kind of start with anything, I like to just kind of cover the basics with everybody, make sure that um, at least terminology-wise, we're using the same terminology. And just understanding that these questions that um, I'm going to be answering, a lot of them really have to be answered specific to the process that you're in. Because when we look at flexography, um, one answer for, say, corrugated doesn't necessarily fully translate over to um, flexible film or wide web printing. And so I want to make sure uh, people do understand that. So we'll kind of run through this and I'll more or less stop it after press designs. When we talk about the analox roller, just make sure everybody recognizes that the analox roller is a, it's a mechanical device. It's a cylinder covered with geometric uh, patterns engraved into the surface of that um, roller. And the only purpose of that analox roller is to give you the same ink film thickness all the way across the roller and all the way around the roller. And every single time that roll spins, you want that same ink film thickness. Because consistent ink film thickness is how we control our color and also predict uh, what's going to happen with, um, with the printing process. This analog roller, um, has, typically when we look at it, I'm going to be basically referencing ceramic analog rollers, ceramic coated analog rollers. Thank you. Historically, we're used to seeing these cells looking like a honeycomb pattern. But I do want people to recognize that because that's engraved by a laser, there's a lot of different patterns that you can put into an analog roller to get different um, ink transfer characteristics. You'll have um, this uh, wavy pattern here, which I more or less will attribute to an open channel, open cell. You have elongated hexa hexago hexagonal shapes that um, yeah, have been like developed. You have just straight channels. You have channels that run at different angles to the side, which we'll, we typically call trihelical. And another letter. So as we get to this, recognize that there are these different engraving options that could be discussed or explored as we move through. Now, when we talk about analog roll engravings, we uh, traditionally talk about or describe our analog roll engravings by three main attributes, our cell volume, our cell count, and cell angle. And with those three attributes, we can more or less um, understand what the capability of that roll is going to be in terms of delivering ink to the sub. And delivering ink to the plate and subsequently the substrate. Um, so we just we talk in terms of cell volume. In the U.S., we describe as BCMs per square inch. We know what kind we have. Cell count is the number of cells in a given inch. Um, if you're in European countries, and it's by the metric system, uh, but most people do understand cells per inch or lines of cells per inch. And then the cell angle, the angle of the engravings of the cells in that analog roller. And we use that angle of engraving to get our cell. Okay. And if people have more specific questions about that, um, if they're still new to the basics, uh, we'll cover that. The one thing that everybody uh, needs to understand, too, is that one analog roller can behave differently based off of how you meter that ink off the analog roller. So if you're going to be using something like a chamber blade system, uh, essentially what you have is you have an ink ink sump that gets uh, or ink well that pumps into the chamber, and then that roller spins around, and you have metering blades that either contain the ink or meter it off and deliver it to your plate cylinder and then to your substrate. Right. So an analog roller with the exact same graving in this metering system might behave differently than an analog roller in this metering system. And so it's important that people involved in this um, ask the questions and understand that um, there's a translation difference between the two. This is a common style system here called a two roller with reverse angle doctor blade. Since you have a fountain roller or a rubber roller that picks the ink up to the analogs, your, your metering blade wipes off the excess ink. And I also refer to that as my quality control device. It's the last thing that touches that analog roller before the ink goes to the plate and then subsequently to the substrate. But you'll find different patterns in here in different styles where there's no blade or this um, ink fountain is directly in the analog, uh, on the analog roller itself. All right. So that right there will give us differences and will require different answers to the questions that we have. And then back up a little bit more, you have these different styles of presses. 
you have your central impression press, you have your stack press, and then you have your inline presses. And then uh, sometimes you'll also hear what's referred to as sheet fed presses uh, that's more or less fall into the inline style. But again, taking that same analog roller into these different market segments will also give us different results. All right. That's more or less uh, my, my quick run through on the basics here. Like I said, I was going to stop here at press designs. But all of this does influence our, um, our outcome and our um, results, and as well as these other components in the process. So if everybody's ready, we'll go ahead and start with the um, uh, questions, okay? And um, now the pressure's on, right? <laughs> So one of the questions I got was, what are some of the ideal engravings for text and line work, screen combo, and process printing? All right. To define that uh, very quickly, text and line work means that basically on that printing plate, there are no dots. It's nothing but solids on that plate. So mm -hmm. we don't have a big concern about dot gain or tone value increase. We have more or less a concern about um, how things are covering the substrate and then how much those lines are spreading or the text is filling in. Screens and combo, basically you're combining now halftone screens or dots on a plate with line work. And the challenge with something like that is uh, solids require more impression than screens to get good ink transfer. And then process printing, that's just a, a special term we use to describe combo printing where we're using CMYK inks. All right. Now that question um, is very hard to answer specifically uh, without knowing what market segment we're in, what substrate we're printing on, and even you know, what style of press you're running and, and um, you know, how fast you want to run. But the, the best way to answer that question is to, um, you basically want to run a test. A lot of times here at Clemson when we run tests, if you have the ability to do this, this is one of the best ways to run a test is to, to use something like a banded analox roller. These um, engravings across the banded analox roller are, um, are, are planned differences. And so what you can do is take that uh, environment that you have with the inks and substrates and everything else, put this roller in, and in one run get, in this situation here, five different uh, test conditions that you can evaluate. All right, so running a test is the best way to get the answer to that. But in general, um, if you talk to, to your supplier or different people involved around flexographic printing there in your market segment, they can give you some ideas. But I did find this um, chart right here for uh, that question. Now, <clears throat> again, it's a very broad range if you're familiar with flexography. 3.5 BCM to 7.5 BCM, that's a, that's a pretty big increase right there. That's a 200% increase in ink, ink film thickness. So that does relate very much to whether you're on a coated substrate, uncoated, um, a very absorbent substrate like craft or film or foils. Okay. But this is a chart that you know, I'll generally look at to get within a range if you need to kind of drill down to that. And then afterwards, um, uh, it's, it's really developing the conversation with your suppliers and seeing what they want. But the general, my rule of thumb is you want the, um, to get the right analog roller, you want the one that's going to, uh, number one, give you the right ink film thickness to cover your substrate. I'm going to flip over and make sure this is showing up in the screen here. All right, so here's a banded roll print right here. <clears throat> to select the right analog roll, you're going to want to make sure that you're covering, uh, getting the ink to cover the substrate. Okay, so we're not covering here. We're getting close here, but here we're finally covering, but then it might be too much. But we're basically going for coverage first, then our quality, meaning how are these reverses, how are the reverses staying open, how are the positives doing, how are um, line resolution targets are doing. And then if we get down into, um, looks like I got some drawings on here. Then we can start looking at our um, tone reproduction. 
Okay, but you can see a big difference from one side to the other based on that um, banded roll there. And that's one color, one substrate. We can go to a different one. And then you can see again here that um, the different results that we get across the, the sheet. All right. But again, not everybody has that opportunity, but you can find examples like this where um, I'll look in, I'll move this in kind of close where y'all can see it. You see the labels at the bottom here. This was um, 1,000 cells per inch. This one's 800, uh, two and a half BCM. What's this, one BCM here? All right. Y'all are welcome to tell me to hurry up and move on too if I spend too much time on a slide there. All right. All right. So that's um, hopefully uh, gives you an idea there. Uh, if we want to talk offline or open up the discussion here live, uh, you're welcome to do that if you have um, a specific environment we you want to talk about. Another question that we had is um, what is the importance of cell volume versus all other engraving specifications, um, specifically cell count? And this is actually probably one of my favorite questions to answer. Um, and actually pose to people because when you look at the um, the three main attributes of the analox roller that I had up earlier, okay, I put them in the order of importance for me. When you get an analox roller engraved, these two attributes right here are never ever going to change during the life of that analox roller. They will stay the same. This is the only attribute right here that will change over the life of the analox roller. And so for me, Cell volume is the most important because cell volume is what's controlling these color differences that you see here in this uh, ink film thickness. Okay, so what does ink film thickness translate to in terms of uh, being on press? All right, as I mentioned, color, color, but then you get into some mechanical things like wet ink trap, and wet ink trap is how well one ink sticks on top of another. Um, it's going to affect your dry rate, how fast that ink will dry. If this print is going across idler rollers or face rollers. If that ink doesn't dry fast enough, it'll offset to those rollers and it'll build up and create little dimples. And then those dimples will actually impress into your ink and create little pocket marks um, if you're not drying it fast enough. Okay. But cell volume. Getting an answer in, uh, of cell volume really lets us know where that analog roller might fall in terms of these attributes or these print results. Okay. Now, most people are um, historically used to hearing cell volume. I'm sorry, cell count. Uh, you know, 1,000 cells per inch, 1,200 cells per inch, 600 cells per inch, and those used to be very closely tied to a specific volume. But now with our laser engraving capabilities that um that um call it that relationship between cell count and cell volume is much broader i mean i can have 500 cells per inch and i can have a 3 bcm or a um, 5 bcm but the other reason um, i want to show you here why cell volume is important to me most important is see how this looks on the screen here you have an analog roller cell that's like this, or you might have one that's like this, different shapes, okay? During the life of that roller, you might get inks and varnishes and coatings and stuff that kind of start filling up the bottom of this roller, or I'm sorry, the bottom of the cell, okay? And as I mentioned, as over time, as this uh, roll um, wears and changes, it started out at 5.0 BCM, Okay, as that fills in and you lose the, the bottom of that cell or either the top of the cell wears off, you might drop to, I'm going to go extreme here, 3 BCM. Okay, I'm not that good with the math here, but that's probably what a, uh, around a 40%, uh, well, 30 to 40% decrease in volume, which is going to change your color going to change your um, or less your ink matching that the uh, ink room is going to have to do 
and so on and so forth. So for me, over time, cell volume, uh, get with your suppliers. There's different methods to measure cell volume over the life of the roll and always be upgrading with a date. So like today is the 14th. You know, today that analog roller was a 5 BCM. Let's say a year from now, 9, 14, 17, that roller might be a 3.5 BCM. All right, gives me a better understanding of what's happening. All right. <clears throat> Another question we had that came in is, um, what's the best way to clean um, my analox roller? And um, so this kind of falls under the category of care and maintenance. I can't stress enough how understanding that this analox roller um, pretty much has a brittle surface to it. And any sharp impact or repetitive impact to it uh, can damage it. If you get anything dry that rubs against that roller, it's going to scratch it. So. The example here for how to um, clean the analog roller, I've got a quick little video. We're not going to run through the whole thing, but just kind of I'll talk through what we're going to do. But conceptually, uh, make sure that you don't um, let that analog roller run dry. Uh, as soon as you take the ink off of it, out of it, get some sort of liquid back in there to keep it wet until you go through your process of cleaning it. Okay. Now, when before I sh show the video there, when I Clean an analog roller. Um, you use something like a stainless steel brush here to to agitate the surface of that roller. Um, these bristles right here are actually softer than the ceramic surface of that analog roller, so this will not hurt that roll. The big thing I see that uh, is a problem with this so is when people work with these brushes, they don't rinse them off and they let the ink dry ink stay in here. That grid acts like sandpaper on these brushes. Okay, so always rinse these brushes off. When you're done, let them sit like this so the water and everything drips down out of them. Um, use some sort of cleaner. I'm not going to show the, the name on the cleaner there, but um, a high pH cleaner to uh, break up that ink and then use some water. In this case, it says distilled water, but it's really just water. Use that water to um, flush those rolls off. Then afterwards, I usually try and use some sort of lint-free cloth, and this has this is very specific to your process. And if it's um, against regulations to touch a roller in your press, by all means, do not touch any rollers in your press. Um, but we use a, um, a cloth like this to to wipe the um, the roll off. A lot of presses now, especially smaller ones, these rolls can come out of the machine to um, to clean up. So I want to show you this. Um, not sure how the sound is on this, but so what you're about to see is the um, this roll has some ink. We've already taken the ink out of the um, the pan, and now what we're going to do is start flushing. Now we we'll take a little bit of water because that roll's been running dry. We'll put some water on here. Right. It's important that that plug is in that pan. So the essence of what's happening here is I'm showing you we're pushing the ink to the sides of the roller. Use the water to kind of okay. And then we'll go to this cleaner, and then the cleaner is really going to really start to break that ink down. Um, any uh, any residuals that's left in the cells, it'll clean that out. Okay. When you spray the cleaner, don't spray it into the. And I'm going to jump up here. All right. So here we are. Or here I am scrubbing the roll with the brush. When you start scrubbing, the ink does dry off. Or the water does dry off a little bit uh, faster. So you got to keep it keep it wet there. Then after that, um, we'll kind of wipe it wipe it dry. And again, this can be done offline. If you're on bigger presses like corrugated presses, uh, typically you cannot do this, and you should not do this because you don't have that capability, and it's not safe enough. All right. But even when you're drying the roll off, always go from the center out. You'll notice now I'm cleaning the edges of the roller. So those are the last things to clean because right, you don't want to pull that from the edge into the center. But when I check a clean roll, I always check the sides because that's always the hardest place to get. All right. And then last thing. Oh, 
I'm missing it. Basically, put a little alcohol on the cloth, and what the alcohol does is it dries that roll and keeps it from getting water spots. But after alcoholing the face of the roll, I again do the sides to really clean that up. Because you can also get color contamination. Um, if you don't clean the sides of your rolls good, that uh, can get back into your pan and then loop around back onto the um, into the ink. All right. And so more or less what you saw there is what I'm talking about here. And then when you're done with the rolls, <clears throat> if they are out of the press, I recommend some sort of um, wrap. Doesn't necessarily have to be anything uh, fancy, but something to wrap those rolls up and keep them protected from objects and whatnot falling down onto the roll. Okay. But one thing you definitely want to do after cleaning, when you have the capability, is just take a moment to to look at that roll, make sure everything looks good. You don't see any water spots, chips, thing, or things of that nature that can cause problems later. And it doesn't hurt to use some sort of magnifying device to um, look at the rolls. Uh, there's a, so much stuff that you can learn just by visually looking at a roll and getting used to what you see there to know if you've got that uh, clean or not. All right, um, you are definitely going to run into situations where, what, depending on what environment you're in, some of the um, coatings and inks that you're going to be running are much more difficult to clean than others. So it's very important that um, you have a process in place and then work on that process and improve the process versus trying to get people to randomly do it um, you know, haphazardly. But get a process that works well in your environment and then improve upon it. But typically coatings and varnishes will create that, uh, what I find, and especially when I inspect the rolls and look at them, they'll create sort of a glaze in the cells and, and sometimes I think it create, it fills in the bottom of those cells a little bit faster than regular inks and coatings. Um, but there, in flexography, you're always gonna run into a point, come to a point where you do have to do something more to clean those rolls. And that's when you get into where you're going to have to use some, some sort of media system, media blasting, whether it's uh, soda, baking soda or um, the plastic, plastic beads. There's a lot of liquid, uh, what I call liquid tanks out there that have a uh, process to clean the rolls up. You can use ultrasonic um, cleaning methods as well. Um, really, again, the best thing to do is talk to other people in your environment or in your market. Uh, talk to your suppliers, and they can recommend the appropriate cleaner for what you're running into. But these right here are to fix typically issues that weren't done by a general maintenance uh, cleaning. Okay. But in my opinion, all cleaning should really, if possible, be done offline. Don't use your valuable press time for it. You know, let your press operators focus on printing. Let somebody else focus on the cleaning. And the thing you have to be careful of there is that the people that are doing the cleaning might not necessarily fully understand the importance of that analog roller. So I think you do need to educate them on how important what their job is to the whole process of, of what's going on. But really good question um, on that uh, cleaning. One of the things that you will might you might run into if you don't clean rolls well is over time, let's pretend this is an abandoned roll, but just a um, time lapse of an analog roller. You might find that your roll started out printing good densities, but over time the densities get lighter from nothing more than rolls not being cleaned properly. Okay. But you are going to run into situations where the um, um, you're going to pull put ink in press and pull, come up to color and find that um, the color's either too light or too dark. And when you run in something like that, <clears throat> the, the kind of the first thing most every, that I always recommend is check your pH and your viscosities of your inks. If you're with water-based inks, if you're with solvent or um, energy curable inks, use, um, uh, you basically have to look at your viscosity. Uh, the other thing to do is look at your doctor blade pressures, make sure your pressures are set right, uh, make sure you're using the right materials. Um, 
for the inks. <clears throat> so if, um, uh, you know, if you're typically using a, a doctor blade like this, but then you have one like this in there, you know, again, get the right one in. Uh, see if that will fix your um, lightness or darkness issue. But conceptually, what you have to think of is if it's too dark, you basically uh, have too much pigment going down to the uh, going to the plate or the substrate. So you got to uh, reduce that concentration either by adding an extender to the ink, adding some reducer, or if it's water-based ink, you can put a little bit of water in there. But do be careful because you can get your colorants and your pigments. Uh, I'm sorry, your pigments and your uh, resins out of proportion, and you could then lose some of your functional characteristics that you need in terms of rub resistance, uh, uh, basically rub resistance, okay? If the color comes in too light, okay, you can increase your pigment concentration. You can also try and change your um, Dr. Blade materials. If you have the ability to change the angle of the doctor blade on the press, you can do that. See if that will give you a little bit more ink coverage, okay? Or a little more ink density. One thing that usually does not happen, um, now some people might see a small change, but typically uh, down here where it says impressions, impression doesn't usually change your density a lot uh, or a significant amount if you're having an issue with density. A lot of times impression is just going to change it within your tolerance, okay? But um, you know, if you try that out sometime and really crank your pressures down, you're going to see that, you know, the density did not change a whole lot. So if all that else, if all else fails, then the only other way to change that density, if you're not going to change your ink formulation or anything else, is if you have the ability to put an analog roller in or out, change your analog roller, okay? One thing that I do caution you on <clears throat> when you do change your analog roller, be careful because you can change. If you see this, you can start getting dot bridging and dirty print based off of the LPI of your graphics. Okay, so your graphics might have been built for, um, say, a low volume analog roller. Then you come to a higher volume, and then all of a sudden your your print goes really bad. Your drop shadows get uh, look bad. <clears throat> your reverses fill in. All right. Had a couple questions on expanded gamut. Um, how does this in printing expanded gamut? How does it change the manner in which you print? What densities um, are you finding? Um, people are using, um, what you consider is, um, you know, key requirements when going to expand a gamut. So I'm going to address those. Um, even with four color printing, the people that are kind of in what I call the spot color world and they want to go into process printing, I say, you know, the first thing to do is make sure you can do your one and two color work very well, very consistent. Uh, make sure you set your impressions right. You have a system in place to manage your inks. Make sure people understand how to troubleshoot print issues with Flexo. And then um, already be measuring your color, even on a one color. If all you're running is, all I have is banded roll samples at the moment. You know, even if you're running something like this, make sure people are used to taking measurements and recording those in and understanding, you know, when they change pH, viscosity, or other parameters on the press, how does that change these numbers? All right. So if you have those fundamentals in place, what I call your um, your golf swing, when you move into expanded gamut, you just swing the same. All right. Now you just have seven inks, or five, or six, versus uh, two, three, or four. All right. But. <clears throat> Um, so we're very used to, um, when we do expanded gamut, I'm sorry, when we do process printing, um, we're very used to measuring densities, which is, you know, that's, that's okay, but we are moving more towards using delta E, because delta E is going to tell us more about the color of that ink than the density. For instance, these two samples right here, I could find that I could have the same density 
here and here, these two could have the same density, but you can see they're different colors. So we want to use something that's going to tell us color um, to control or to at least get things set up. And um, kind of ironically, we've got a study going on right now at Clemson um, with expanded gamut. So I borrowed this. And typically what we do to be successful is we want to plan our hue angles out for our color separations. And so um, let me see if I can get this on the screen here for everybody to see. They're kind of backwards, but um, these are some angles that um, we're experimenting with. We use our hue angle. There we go. So you can see our cyan's around 233. Uh, magenta's were at 357, I think. Yellow's around 92. Black is close to zero uh, for the chroma. Um, you know, technically, black shouldn't have really any angle. Um, orange looks like it's 54. Green is 181. And our, in this case, our violet is a 307. All right. These aren't angles you have to use, but these are ones we're experimenting with. And what those angles are, are doing for us is on call it <clears throat> these 360 degrees here around the circle. So it's getting us even spacing between the colors. So in essence, we're max maximizing our color gamut that we can get. If you have two colors that have that are close in angle, then you're losing everything else you can pick up in that separation there. All right. That's a good question. That's, um, that's a question we're actually trying to answer right now for the industry. Um, this project right here is being done by the, um, actually by the FTA uh, through an F FQC uh, committee. Um, so uh, your associations are working hard to get this information um, figured out and, and out to you. But expanded gamut is a it's very exciting. Uh, there's a lot of good capabilities that you can do with it. Um, and as I say, just jump in. There's no better way to learn something than just go ahead and get involved with it. Uh, if I'm moving too fast, you'll just stop me. <clears throat> uh, there's some questions about um, have we ever done testing at Clemson to show benefits of different engravings over analog rollers? Um, uh, absolutely, we've got our presses here can be used for um, private testing, also for students as well. A lot of stuff that's done, that's not been done, by, done by the FTA or some other tr uh, trade association. Uh, a lot of times, unfortunately, there are NDAs in place. And honestly, we don't ask a lot of questions uh, so that we don't accidentally slip up and uh, giving information out that we shouldn't. But now students, our students take a class of where they have to design experiments and, and run a um, scientific experiment. Projects that students do along those lines um, actually are for the benefit of the industry and, and our public information. Okay. But typically for something like this that requires engravings of analog rollers, that requires a lot of um, commitment by a lot of different suppliers to get these in for the students. Um, so we haven't done a lot, let's say, in terms of student testing um, along these lines. But if we have roles at Clemson that have these different engravings, then by all means we we use them and uh, can show print samples and off of, print samples off of that 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 we've done. There's a question about trends in corrugated um, changes that we've seen in the last five to ten years. Uh, I'm going to go off the assumption that this is for direct print corrugated, meaning we're directly printing onto the corrugated substrate. Um, the presses themselves have gone through a, a fabulous plateau, or I'm sorry, fabulous jump from um, geared systems to servo drives. Uh, it's made a world of difference in terms of registration on the presses, and not only registration, but um, taking out what I call vibrations through the machine. Uh, because each unit's independently driven by its um, by a servo motor. 
Uh, corrugated presses are adopting the quick change analog roller mentality. And when I say that mentality is we're learning to build the presses to the graphics. Okay, which we do that in wide web, we do it in narrow web. Designer comes up with some graphics. We build the, the system to those graphics. In corrugated, you're set with that analog roller or doctor blade system. And so designers have to know how to build to the press. Um, but by changing analog rollers, we can now reverse that a little bit. Uh, green, what I call green conscious inks. Uh, finding um, these ink suppliers are using more eco-friendly inks um, to help with the carbon footprint of printers. And um, another thing that I'm seeing is uh, people adopting these non-traditional engravings in the analog rollers. And I guess I didn't really talk about the benefits of some of these non-traditional engravings. Uh, so kind of what would be important to you or to those listening is what we're trying to achieve by these different engravings is getting denser solids, all right, more density in the, in the actual solids that we're printing. Uh, but at the same time, allowing us to run the higher, higher line screen uh, half tones where the screens are staying open and not, we're not getting dot bridging and dirty print. Um, but at the same time, these denser solids are reverses. Uh, at the same time, we're staying open, not filling in. So that's what these different engravings can do for us. And then when you go into your cleanup, okay, with these open channel formats and these elongated cells, uh, because it's wider open, it's easier for these cleaners and whatnot to get into those cells and pull the ink out. In essence, maintain the life of that, um, or maintain the volume of that analog roller. Uh, if anybody has any other trends they want to throw in or add to the list here, feel free to do that. Um, just off the top of my head, that's what came into mind. Obviously, there's a lot of um, plate technologies that are being developed, uh, screening algorithms that are going onto the plates, um, different technologies for flat top dots surface texturing of the dots um, or the surface texturing of the plates to help improve that ink transfer. All right. There are some questions about trends in the flexible film. Uh, same thing, uh, presses are improving. Uh, automatic registration, automatic impression, uh, ease of changeover so while the press is actually running you can be setting up for another job on a couple stations that are um, down from it um, the web inspection systems to me are really really getting good um, with the camera technology with the software with the speed of the computers you can now do uh, full web um, uh, tracking or inspection you can track the defects uh, the in the flexible film industry, presses are getting much, much faster, uh, doing this um, more of a, a hands-off method in terms of they set themselves up and, and get up to speed you know, on their own. Uh, did talk about the plate technologies, uh, the sleeve technology for the presses, um, non-traditional engravings, again, on the analog rollers, and then these lighter weight analog rollers are using lightweight materials like carbon fiber and other other uh, technologies it just makes it easier to move these rollers in and out um, if you take away weight in the press that they basically just like a car if the car weighs more it's going to take more energy to run that car uh, if you get weight off these analog rollers and other devices um, it's uh, much more economical to run these machines we get a lot of other trends that are probably um, I'm missing here in terms of um, the way people are formulating inks to run at these higher speeds, and then the um, the backing material behind the plates, your sticky back, your cushion backs, um, have to be able to take those impacts at those high speeds and, and, and spring back to the, the thickness that they were originally. Okay. But trends are also fun to talk about. Um, these markets are continuing to grow and grow and grow. So um, we've got to uh, basically deliver faster and faster and faster. 
Another question that we that came up was uh, Dr. Blade selection. Um, there's a lot of different um, good materials out there to choose <clears throat> for Dr. Blades. Um, you've got plastic materials, uh, also called engineered plastics. You have your, your metal blades. You have, uh, I don't have a composite blade here to show you, but you have your uh, composite materials that'll have uh, different materials in there to give them different structural strengths, um, different white capabilities. But typically, um, in choosing a doctor blade, I tell people, are you looking for blade life? Are you looking for personal safety? Or do you want you know, the highest quality that you can get? Or where do you want to be somewhere in that uh, triangle there? Okay. And so typically, um, depending on where you want to be in that, that triangle, then you can choose your material based off of what's available. You can choose how thick of a blade that you need. Typically, your thickness is going to help you with your um, um, blade life. And then there's a lot of edge profiles with, with Dr. Blades that you can choose from. I'm going to flip back over to the screen here. When you look at Dr. Blades, they can just have a, a squared edge. They can have what's called a, a, a rounded edge to them. I'll put it rounded on both sides. It could be square on that side. You can have beveled blades like that. They can have different angles to the bevel. You can have um, what I call the lamella blades where you have a thick support here, but then they step down and, and come out this way. So a lot of different profiles that you can find to a blade. And the purpose of those profiles are basically to help um, with a consistent wipe over the life of the blade, but also when that blade first sets in on the analog roller. Okay, and as it's wiping, you want to get your, your wipe to be consistent almost immediately. So these different styles of tips can do that for you. Okay. Oh, and I should mention that there are doctor blades out there too that might be a metal blade, but then there's a coating or special coating that's applied to the blade to give it an even longer wear life. Whereas, let's say, in corrugated, this blade might have lasted um, 20 hours of runtime. By putting a blade in that has a coating on it, you might find it runs for 40 hours. Okay. So, again, your suppliers are a great great group to talk to, um, to give you what their experiences are. But a lot of times what, what you have to be aware of here when you do select doctor blades is what is the engraving of the analogs roller? Does that analogs, does that analogs roller have, now I'm going to go to cells per inch, 250 cells per inch or 1,000 cells per inch? Okay. The 250 cells per inch means that your cells are bigger. So that's a rougher surface for the doctor blade to run across. So that rougher surface is going to wear your blade down quicker. If you have a thousand cells per inch, all right, you've got a lot of little cells all packed in. You've got a smoother surface for that blade to, to ride across. So the same blade material might last twice as long or three times as long just because of the engraving of that analogs roller. So that that is very much tied to your um engraving on that analog roller. So uh, those were really good questions that came in. Um, those were, as I recall, every all the questions that we did have. Uh, if anybody online has any other questions they'd like to put out to the audience, um, definitely would like to hear that. Generally on these, uh, these webinars, people tend to stay a little quiet, so I'll be surprised if anybody does um, chime in, but feel free to, to do so. Wait a few minutes just to see if anybody does. Are you able to hear me, Kern? I uh, can now. Oh, you can hear me? Yep, I can hear you. Okay, hi, this is Elizabeth Boynton. Um, I just had a question on um, 3D cameras. Do you folks work with any, or do you have a preference as to which 3D camera you would recommend? So when you say 3D camera, um, I need a little help with that. To define what you're using for the 3D camera. 
of the 3D um, camera. Well, yeah, um, what we're using is a like a 200x and a 400x microscope just for quick visual inspections. Um, okay. But there's also like the um, AniCam that, in addition to viewing the um, cells, you can also measure them, measure the yeah. volume, okay. the angle. Yeah. So um, cameras for inspecting your analog rollers that are tied to software. Um, yeah. There's um, like you mentioned, you have the AniCam that's out there. You have um, the 3D QC. Um, I know there's some others. There's some um, other opportunities out there where people are taking little microscopes, tying them to a um, a computer, and they've got some software they run in the background. Uh, really, I, all the ones that I've had experience with on that are, are really good. It's just what's going to work best in your environment. Um, you know, is this thing going to be press side or is it going to be back in the lab? Because uh, a lot of them, some of them are um, sensitive to vibration in the floor and everything that's around it. So you got to make sure that it's in a, a stable environment so you don't get a lot of you know, shake to the image. But I, as far as field testing for me, I like, um, I like just some sort of microscope like this that has a light to it. Um, you can also get these little, um, rem, what I call remote, but um, I've gotten them off of Amazon. They're called like a little Coleman digital camera, but it's a digital microscope. It's, all, it's got a little screen on it. You can zoom in with it and actually get a picture right on that that you know comes over to your, to your computer. But in general, <clears throat> with um, engravings of, um, I talk in this term, uh, cells per inch. If I'm 800 cells per inch or lower, I find that a 30X microscope works well for me or a 50X. Uh, just again, like I said, in the field to see what's down in those cells. If you get to above 900 cells per inch, you might need to go to a 60 or a 70 or 100x microscope to really look down in those cells. The big thing with the magnification is it just um, the higher the magnification goes, the harder it is to just to keep your focus because any wiggle on the the device does change your your focus. All right. Thank you. Yep. Good question. Thank you. I'll wait a few minutes, see if there's any other questions that, that come up. All right. Well, I hope this was um, beneficial to everybody that, um, that, that checked in. I do want to uh, give a, a big thank you out to Marco again for inviting me to do this talk. Um, Again, well, Karen, from Marco needs to thank you as well. Really appreciate oh. <laughs> your uh, efforts today, and yeah. uh, really, really some good value. I appreciate it. All right, well, I appreciate that. And um, my understanding is this is a series that you all are doing, and you've um, got a panel of people that you're uh, inviting to do these. So I do appreciate the invite, and um, hopefully, I can be on another panel somewhere down the road. Well, we'll certainly invite you back. Karen. Thank yeah. you. And even if you invite the other schools, I'll still get on. <laughs> <laughs> it all depends all... on where your it all depends on where your football team is. If they, uh, <laughs> they end I have full confidence that these these games y'all have been you have been seeing are just uh, we're, we're tricking everybody. We're, we're saving the best for when we need it. Uh, That's great. Yeah. Katie, right, again, well, thank, thank you, you for setting this up. You did a great job. And I will, if there's nothing else, we'll go ahead and sign off. And um, everybody have a great, great afternoon. Thank you, Karen. Thank you. All right. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye. Thanks, Karen.